All right, here are the notes for Chapter 6. This is Population and Community Ecology. Uh, since I'm gone, I'm giving you the online version of this. I'm recording. Uh, I'm just going to stream through this. If you need to go back, you're going to need to stop the, te stop the video, go back and re-listen to it. Uh, you might have to watch it a couple times if you want to get everything I do. So here we go. All right, nature exists at several levels of complexity. Uh, through this, we're going to look at individual population, community, ecosystem, and biosphere. Uh, like you say, in the individual level, you're looking at a specific species at that one. Population, when you look at the population, you're looking at the population dynamics, uh, the unit of evolution. You're usually just looking at one species in that area. When you go to community, you're looking at all of the species in the area together and how they are working together or at odds with one another. Uh, at the ecosystem level, it's all the biotic and abiotic species of a region, how they are now interacting with one another. And the biosphere is, like we said before, it's to total earth, everything together. Uh, scientists usually study communities mostly and see how the species interact with each other. And a lot of times these communities are named for the dominant species in the area. Uh, one of the things you're going to need to look at in your book are population dynamics. It's a way of seeing how much of a population is actually out there. It's basically looking at the number of inputs to a population minus the number of outputs. Your inputs are going to be births plus immigration. That's your inputs. Your outputs are going to be death plus emigration, so the people leaving your, your community. So that's one of the things you're going to look at in the book. Because uh, population ecology is the study of factors that cause populations to go up and down. So endangered species, we're trying to help those. Pest species, how do we lower those numbers? Different things like that. That's what population ecology kind of looks at. And for here, population size, the total number of individuals within a given area at a given time. So... We looked at population size. One of the ones we studied was the condor back in 1987. There were only 22 left. As of 2009, there were 300 of them. Population density, the number of individuals per unit area at a given time. Uh, this is where you look at hunting and fishing licenses because you only can catch so many fish in a day and you can only hunt so many of a certain species during the hunting season. This is where we look at density and how we control densities of populations. Population distribution, how individuals are distributed with respect to one another. Uh, trees, are they random in the wild? And then we have plantations that we do where we do you very uniform. And, or, and then we do family or pod animals that are clumped together. So there's all different types of distributions we can look at. Population sex ratio, the ratio of males to females. Normally it's close to 50-50 males to females is what you would like. And then population age structure, how many individuals fit into the particular, particular age categories. So the younger people, the, the more younger people you have, the quicker you can grow because they'll be coming into birthing age sooner. The more people you have in the older ages, the slower your population will grow because there's not as many people in the birthing ages. Here are a few examples of random distribution, uniform distribution, and clump distribution. All right, factors that influence population size. First ones we're going to talk about are density-dependent factors. The size of the population will influence an individual's probability of survival. The biggest one is food. If you don't have a food source, that's going to be a hard way for your group to survive. On page 154 in your book, there's a good growth of population with food chart that you need to see. And make sure you take a look at that on page 154. Others are limiting resources. These are resources that a population cannot live without and which occur in quantities lower than the population would require to increase size. So make sure you have to look at limiting resources then too. Another thing is carrying capacity. This is going to be a variable K for us later on. Uh, this is the limit to how many individuals get the resource. So you might have a po population. If, you're li if you don't have enough of a resource, only a certain amount of your community will get the resource. The next one is density independent factors. Density independent factors. These are the factors the size of the population has no effect on the individual's probability of survival. So these are things that happen like tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and fires and climate events and things like that. That's all density independent factors. It's outside of the population of the group. All right, next we're looking at the exponential growth model. 
Uh, the, the, the growth model, the number of offspring an individual can produce in a given time period minus the deaths of the individual or offspring during the same time period. So in tr this is basically what we're looking at growth rate. If you're going to have a good growth rate, you need to have more births than deaths. That's kind of goes without saying. Then you have also the intrinsic growth rate. Under ideal conditions with unlimited resources, the maximum potential for growth. And there's a little formula that goes with this. You need to look at your book in this. NT equals N-O-E-R-T, where NT is the future population, N-O is current. This is all in your book. I'm just saying it out loud here, but you need to look at your book for this. Uh, e is the natural log, or basically we use 2.72. T is time, and R is an intrinsic growth rate. And I'll talk more about this whenever I get back uh, to class. Uh, here's our J-shaped curve. This is good conditions. When a graph has exponential growth, the model looks like this. Uh, basically, as you see over time, the population size will increase. There's the formula I was talking about before. I guess I should have said it here. Uh, but basically, it's showing you exponential, exponential growth. No species can go through exponential growth forever. Something's going to happen. Whether it's going to be uh, density dependent or uh, independent, on it, you're going to have something that happens to the community or the species that would stop the exponential growth. Here we have the logistic growth model, which is more realistic uh, for growth models of populations. This is when a population whose growth is initially exponential, but slows as the population approaches the carrying capacity. You see here on the graph where you have the carrying capacity, that's where you're reaching your limit of how many bodies or about how many uh, individuals you can support with the resources you have. So that's going to be our K constant. Uh, so once we get to that, we need to level off and not have as many people because if we shoot past that, we're going to have a lot of deaths. And there are communities that end up doing that. We're going to talk more about them in a little bit. So we call this an S-shaped curve as before the one was a J-shaped curve. J-shaped curve gives us the exponential growth. The S-shaped curve gives us the log uh, logistic growth. And the logistic growth is the one that we really want. All right, variations on the logistic model. If food becomes scarce, the population will experience an overshoot by becoming larger than the spring carrying capacity and will result in a die-off of populations. As you see this, we in this graph, we've got basically exponential growth, and then all of a sudden there's not enough food or there's not some enough of a resource, and you've overshot that, and then it heads up, and you have the overshoot area, and then you have a die-off and it gets to the carrying capacity, but they're still dying off because you still don't have enough food for everybody, and then it springs back and forth and back and forth. This is uh, one of the variations called an overshoot. All right, reproductive strategies. We're going to talk about two, K and R here. K-selected species, these are populations of species uh, that grow slowly until it reaches the carrying capacity. So elephants and whales and humans these do not tend to have many offspring whenever they do reproduce. So there's not going to be an overabundance of them when it happens. Uh, typically, you're looking at large reproductive maturity, produce few uh, large offspring. Uh, they provide parental care for their young. And so it's these types of animals that go through K-selective species. The other is R-selective species, the population of a species that grows quickly and is often followed by overshoots and die-offs like mosquitoes and dandelions and rats and cockroaches, and there's all kinds of species, and they generally don't have little parenting for their young. They're usually very small. Uh, they reach reproductive age very quickly, and they reproduce very frequently. Here's a good chart that shows you the differences between K-selected species and R-selected species, uh, and it, help, it brings down several of the different topics that they can ask questions about. Here are survivorship curves. We have type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 survivorship curve is a K-selected species. It has high survival rates for type 1. Type 2, there in the middle, is gradually declines through life. This is survivorship species. And type 3, there on the bottom, is actually the R-selected species. They have a very low survival rate few in each adulthood. So... In between, so the type 1 is the K that we talked about, and type 3 is the R that we uh, talked about. So type 2 is a gradual decline uh, throughout the life, like squirrels and corals would follow this. 
All right, metapopulations. Metapopulations are a group of spatially distinct populations that are connected by occasional movement of individuals between them. So if you look at this little picture they have here, on each one of these hilltops, we could consider each um, animal, or I guess it's cougars or pumas or something like that that lives on there, and you'll have a colony on each one of these, and then they can intermingle occasionally, giving you, here we have five separate metapopulations. Now we're going to start taking a look at community, community ecology, which is the study of the interactions with determine the survivorship of species in a habitat. Uh, the first one we look at is competition. Competition is the struggle of an individual to obtain a limiting resource. So you're trying to get these limiting resources as you are. What happens is, is we've got two different uh, bacteria here. And you see if they're just by themselves in the top two of the, uh, of the slide here. And at the bottom, if we bring both of them together and they're both fighting for the same limiting resource, the, the one species actually is starting to die off because the other one is more dominant and is taking the limiting resource from them. So this is how competition works. If you have two different species fighting for the same resource, one will win. That's called the competition exclusion principle, which two spe species competing for the same resource cannot coexist. So that's the competitive exclusion principle. Next, we have resource uh, petitioning. Uh, basically, this is two species divide a resource based on differences in the species' behavior or morphology. Uh, one of them is the temporal res resource uh, petitioning. Two species use the same resource at different times, like wolves and coyotes. So they'll use the same resource, but, but they'll use it at different times of the year. Uh, another one could be spatial resource petitioning. Uh, reduce competition by using different habitats, like desert plants. They will get water different ways. Uh, not all of them just get water by pulling it out of the ground. Some of them get pulled out of the air and things like that. Uh, morphology resource partitioning. This is different body sizes or shapes will help develop this. Uh, Darwin did this when he studied the finches. There were 14 species of finches. All got food in the same area, but they got food different ways. So they weren't actually in the same niche. They were actually able, because of their beak size and how they got their food, they were all able to survive. Next we have predation. Predation is the use of one species as a resource by another species. True predators kill and consume their prey. That's what a true predator does. Next we have herbivores. They consume plants as prey, but herbivores do not consume the entire plant most of the time as do not kill it, so it will grow back and they will be able to consume it again. Parasites live on, on or in the organism they consume, and parasi parasitoids lay eggs inside other organisms to where their offspring will then grow inside of the organisms. Next, we have mutualism. Mutualism is a type of interspecific -spe interaction where both species benefit, like plants and insects that pollinate the plants. They have a mutually beneficial because of the insects or the bees, we could say bees here, uh, that come around and pollinate, but they are also getting something from the plants also. So they're both mutualistic. They're both benefiting. Here we have uh, uh, commensalism, a type of relationship in which one species benefits, but the other is neither harmed nor helped. You can think of this as a bird perching on a tree. Uh, the tree is helping the bird, but the tree is really not getting much out of it, or a fish hiding in coral. Uh, the fish is able to hide and getting something out of the coral, but the coral is not getting anything from the fish right there. Uh, we also have sim symbiotic relationships, or the relationships of two species that live in close association with each other, to where they can they basically can kind of feed off of each other, but it's not always going to be uh, this way. All right, now we're getting to something called a keystone species. Every community has a keystone species. A uh, keystone species is a species that plays a role in its community that is far more important than its relative abundance might suggest. They tend to be in low numbers in the species, but they play a very important role in the community. Uh, uh, f uh, sea stars eating mussels in the tidal pool areas. If you take away the sea stars, and the mussels will take over, and the other species will diminish in that case. So sea stars, in that case, were the keystone species because they were limiting the growth of mussels, keeping everybody else able to thrive. So every community has a keystone species, and it's 
identifying that species, and if something happens to that species, it's really bad for the community. We also have something called predator-mediated competition. This is a competition in which a predator is instrumental in reducing the abundance of a superior comp uh, competitor, allowing inferior competitors to persist, uh, where an animal will come in and kill off some of the larger predators that were in the area, allowing some of the smaller species to then thrive. We also have something called ecosystem engineers, like the little beaver you see here. Uh, they create or maintain habitats for other species, where the beavers would build, build a dam that creates ponds for aquatic life and then other ecosystem can form there. So those are ecosystem engineers. Sorry that my picture is kind of cutting off some of the words here, but it's also in your book, and I'm going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about ecological succession now. This is the predictable replacement of one group of species by another group of species. The first one we always start with is primary succession. Primary succession occurs on surfaces devoid of soil, like rock or parking lots, things like that. Uh, basically where you start with rocks and you see on the left side of our screen here we start with rocks and then this is the logical progression of primary succession where you start with rocks and then it progresses all the way up to beech and maple trees that take longer to grow where you had the aspens that are shorter time periods before that. So this is primary succession. Again, I'm sorry that the, the slide that came across is kind of messed up here. Secondary succession occurs in areas that have been disturbed but not have not lost their soil yet. So this could be something like you had a fire and it burned everything down. You're not starting from rock or asphalt like primary succession would. You're actually starting with some fertile soil and things like that. So our first step for secondary succession is you can have annual plants and then it works its way up. You can see this difference between primary and secondary succession. I want to say something more about the aspen and cherry trees and stuff like that. We call these pioneer species because they colonize new areas rapidly and grow well in full sun. So that's why we call them fast growing trees. Uh, shade tolerant trees grow under the canopy of these trees when, the dominant, uh, do when they dominate the forces. So the beech and maple trees will start growing under the canopies of these and then take over. Here is a good slide showing aquatic succession. So it basically is showing you the succession. So the terrestrial one, here's an aquatic one. All right, factors that determine species richness, how rich of a species there is in an area. Uh, the first one is latitude. The farther away from the equator, the number of species will decline. So the further away you get from the equator, the, uh, the less number of species. If you look at, uh, in the United States, we're looking at plants. In the U.S., there's 12,000 kinds of plant. And in Canada, there's 1,700 kinds of plant. So we're just looking at specific species in these plants. But the further up you go, the less you get. The next one is time. The longer a habitat exists, the more colonized speciation and extinction occur. Similar lakes in Siberia and Utah were looked at. In Siberia, which is a very old lake, had 580 species of invertebrates, where in Utah you only had four species of invertebrates. Uh, the other one here is habitat size. Habitat size. And so the larger the habitat size you have, the more species that it can hold and the more uh, speciation and evolution that can take place there. All right, and the theory of island biogeography. This theory of island biogeography is the theory that explains that both habitat size and distance determine species rich richness. So the larger the island, the more species you can have. It'll sp support more species, uh, large, uh, less prone to extinction, more environmental conditions, so you can have more niches for the animals or plants to live in, and more chance for speciation. Uh, you'll find that large land masses, like islands that are closer to larger, like continents, have more species on them than the islands that are further away from continents. This follows this also. All right, this is the end of the notes for chapter six. Uh, if you need more of them, watch them again. Uh, good luck.